Rangers drop points, Celtic have the opportunity to go top of the league with only nine games remaining. But John Beaton had other ideas. Welcome to 20 Minute Tims. Melly, Stephen, it has been a couple of quiet weeks on the VAR front. We've not managed to or had to <laughs> dig out the Super Vario World theme tune, yeah. which goes something like this. Da -da 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 -da. VAR. And there'll be an audio <laughs> cue dropped in there. I noticed I noticed we've had some posts on X. Yeah. Um, you know, some, no, some really good stuff on there these days. Yeah, I know we've had some posts. Like, when are you going to do the VAR <laughs> theme tune? Well, it's here, it's back. And it's back thanks to Ron Dobertson, Melly, and <laughs> John Beaton. Producing what is on Jeton, yeah. No, producing what is, frankly, an astonishing display of on Robertson's half, probably incompetence on John Beaton's half. Millie's a cheat. Oh, oh, it's, oh we're in hot. Uh, strong in hot. words from the start. Prove, no, prove me wrong. Yeah. At this stage, prove me wrong. I refuse. Because <laughs> here's the, here's the problem, right? And I was saying this off off camera before we started. If you go to John Beaton and go, you're a cheat. Why do you think I'm a cheat? Because I saw you in a Rangers pub after a Rangers game celebrating with Rangers fans. I have seen numerous videos of you look at similar incidents and call them differently for different teams. That's why I think you're a cheat. His only defence is, nah, I'm not a cheat. I'm just useless. <laughs> <laughs> That's So yeah. which is it? At this point, it's up to him to decide whether or not he's completely, woefully incompetent at his job or he's a cheat. That's that's the two options open to him right now. Quite a remarkable defence for incompetence that though, isn't it? Or for any any defence of doing a job badly. Ah, come on. I didn't do it deliberately. I'm just really bad at this. Yeah. Yeah. Where in which other job you would get away with this in the world that I've absolutely Imagine no you were idea. working at a shop and the boss came, you've been dipping the till, all this money's been disappearing, you're dipping the till, we're we're convinced of it. We've got footage of all the money disappearing, it's going somewhere and you go, Oh no, I've not been stealing, I've just been binning it. <laughs> All right, well, as you were then, back to work. I'm sorry, but incompetence at this point, Melly, is no defence. It's not. It's again, over the last wee while, we've come on moaning about Celtic here and we can't do that despite Celtic getting beat here because I feel like they were up against it and it wasn't exactly the players' fault they were up against. It wasn't the manager's fault. Again, it comes down to refereeing decisions and it just costs Celtic so much and the way, the way it's going now is, is this the way football is going to be? And then when you look into the decision, the only way it should be, mm. it's not the way that VAR was told, we were told VAR was going to sort things out, it's not sorted anything really, has it? And it's just, again, ruined another game and get, ruined a chance for Celtic to go top of the league. What a season. What a mm. season this is. Lots of fun every single weekend. It's, it's yet another fiasco for VAR. And I, I absolutely hate coming on here and having to talk about Aye. different decisions and refereeing, and especially VAR. I can't stand it. I don't look forward to coming on and doing a football podcast for the club we support. Mm. And this is the, the main story of the week. But there's no avoiding it. And I'm, I'm afraid we're, we're here to talk about what has affected Celtic's... There's more to it, of course. Celtic haven't been good this season. Yep. Right? I, I appreciate that. Yep. And I, I, do, I do accept that, which is why I'm not... I'm not making it a, a sob story that we've been affected by VAR, but it's happened one too many times now. And that was the entire story of that game for yeah. me. Well, not the entire story, but it's the headline from that game, unfortunately. Some absolutely mystifying decisions, decisions that I just can't agree with at all. And I, I tend to pride myself on being relatively balanced on here when it comes to these things. I don't, th I don't necessarily just go, well, it's a Celtic thing, so therefore I'm just going to go with the Celtic decision on it every single time. I don't do that. But on this occasion, I just can't really agree with really anything that, that led to the result of that game. Celtic weren't, I don't think they were good, but on this occasion... We'll get to the Celtic yeah, performance, we definitely will. But on this occasion, I'm not looking at it as yet another slightly lacklustre and underwhelming performance from Celtic. I just think it was basically taken away from them in mm. the first 15, 16 minutes of the game. And what about the argument that you get, that a lot of Celtic fans have been given it, is, I but you still need to win the game. <laughs> yeah. or, or, or let me rephrase it another way. Simply win, <laughs> yes. Simply win. It's a difficult place to go. I know that, and it, and it's a. It's history has dictated that we we rate Brendan Rodgers as a guy who's capable of getting results when you're up against it. In in those circumstances, in the constant reference we make is that time at Ibrox where we went mm. a couple of well, at least one goal down, got a man sent off, and came back and won. But I think crucially, what the difference is, it's not the only difference. Maybe. But you look back to that team, that was Odds and Edward who brought off the bench to make yeah, a difference. Yeah. And I looked at the squad for that game 
and Patrick Roberts didn't get off the bench. Then even Charlie Masonda was on the bench. Jack Hendry comes on, and I know Jack Hendry was the most popular mm. of footballers here, but he's better than some of the defenders we've got now. We with players that could make a difference. Kyogo came on and tried his hardest. He really did, but it was gone by that point. So I think it's it's unfair. And I've had my criticisms of these players and Brendan Rodgers this season. I think it would be unfair of us to just say, we'll do that again, mm. like he did six years ago or whenever that was. So yeah. a very, very difficult afternoon for Celtic and we'll, we can get into why. I'm Ellie, we'll talk about each of the, the, the sort of individual referee and issues that, that cropped up in the game. But for me, I think it's... You said on the match reaction, patreon.com slash 20 Minute Tims, if you want to support the podcast, get extra podcast videos and writing, including match reactions. Melly, you said on the match reaction that you know, it's not impossible for Celtic to win at Tyne Castle uh, against easily the third best team in the league. A team that are maybe in better form than Celtic. I've not had a look at the form table in a while. Yeah, they have been for a while, to be honest, yeah. It's, it's not impossible, but they need to play the perfect game. And you're really, 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 really up against it. Getting a man sent off for the majority of the game. There was like, over the course of the full game, there was around 15 minutes extra time added. So you're playing a full 90 minutes, really, yeah. with 10 against 11, and you get a goal down. And there's also, you know, the uh, this isn't the referee's fault specifically, but there's obviously a massive demoralising effect that that has on the team. The whole, the whole mentality of the team takes a dunt when you lose a guy and then immediately get a guy sent off. And not only that, you've also missed a penalty game, you think. It's going against us. And so it's not out with the realms of possibility that Celtic could have won that game, but it was massive, massive, massive odds that they, they would lose it. Yeah, everything. If Celtic were doing that, they would have had to have everybody sort of play the perfect game and everything go right for them. But that didn't happen, did it? We'd mm. already oh, missed a penalty. You can sort of write that off because the sending off happened after that. But I think the, the penalty on 43 minutes, I know the game ended up going to 50 minutes, but that's kind of right before half time. And once you get to the above 40 minute mark I was just looking right to see if we can get to half time regroup maybe make a change or two we could maybe get into this game but Brendan Rodgers pretty much did exactly what he done when he went down to 10 men at mm -hmm. Ibrox he went 4-3-2 put Dyson Maid up front alongside Adam Ida. and it was alright the problem with that is we don't really have the full backs who can get up and down and yeah. give us the width so it was going to be difficult for Celtic changed it in the second half and went 4-2-3 and try to go a bit more direct but Hearts had five at the back, so there wasn't much space. And when when you do go down to 10 men, it's always going to be difficult. But I think that was just exasperated by the fact that Celtic were missing Callum McGregor as well. So yeah. going into this Hearts game without Callum McGregor was a big ask already to be a man down after 15 minutes. Maybe not Mission Impossible, but as close to as possible. I think sometimes the team that are that have the man advantage are a little bit wary of those mm -hmm. circumstances. I think Stephen Naismith said that after the game. Sometimes things don't go your way, even though you do have the extra man. Sometimes the other team can dig in and find a little bit of energy from somewhere. But that those tend to be applied when it's you're down to ten men for twenty five minutes yeah. or something, like, not an entire game. So it's I think it's completely different on this occasion. Let's talk about the decisions then. I noticed with interest Sky do this sort of ask the referee and they had Dermot Dingback Gallagher on. <laughs> and the guy is just he's all over the place. He literally must turn up at the Sky Studios, get a coffee, make up on and go <sighs> penalty, no penalty, penalty, and then walk off and yeah, collect yeah. his check because someone very quickly pulled out an instant feature in O in the high boot and compared it to the Yang in the high boot, the difference being quite stark. O actually caught the guy, Yang didn't catch the guy, and Dermot Gallagher, speaking on the O one, goes, ah, that's a book and it's never a red card. And then on Yang, he said it was a red card. So I watched with interest that that referee... He's so just went with the referee's decisions. He's just went with the referee's decisions. I quite surprising that, isn't it? What I've noticed about that, before we move on from Dermot Gallagher, I noticed that whenever we criticise him and say, like, he's just out there saying stuff he's just saying stuff on mm -hmm. these on these broadcasts he's just filling content says I but <laughs> what I've noticed is that when you say that fans of other clubs get in touch and say oh so you know better than former referees so let me get this straight we all agree in this country that the current referees are rubbish but as soon as you're a former referee you're an absolute voice of authority on these matters <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. And I do, as long as I'm clear yeah. the, the thing is before I mean you've sort of brought up something I want to talk about anyway my issue here is that a lot of the comments you get from other fans of other clubs, and there'll be plenty on this because they're all tuning into 20 minute times at the moment, right? Yeah, uh, brace hope, yourself for emojis. Hopefully we'll convert some of them, right? That's what I want to <laughs> do. They, not, not six weeks ago or not eight weeks ago, whenever it was, Rangers fans were saying exactly the same stuff on the Rangers podcast that we're saying just now about incompetent referees yeah. and VAR 
and the club demanding answers and meetings and not wanting Willie call up. They're saying exactly... Release the audio? Release the audio. They're saying exactly the same stuff we were saying about an issue that wasn't anywhere near as contentious. But the minute the shoe's on the other foot, they're like, ha, 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 this is pathetic. And what we've always said on this podcast is, well, Stephen says it better than me, so I'll try and sum it up. But you always say whenever we complain about referees, this will happen to you someday. Yeah, yeah that's it. I, I think in the main, people don't really get it. They can't see the past. They can't see past the opportunity for point scoring online yeah. and, and completely ignore the wider issue. Everyone in the main agrees that the referees are rubbish. But whenever things like this happen, if we start complaining about refs, oh, it's a conspiracy. And then... Yeah. The next week it will be the, the other way around. Like we're not we're guilty of it as well as a support. We just do the exact same thing when referees when Rangers are complaining about referees, we do the same to them. Mm-hmm. Which is oh, it's a cons- I thought it was a conspiracy. This is the worst conspiracy. It's it's very very tiring to do that. And this is the whole reason that Rangers eh, Rangers well slip of the tongue. <laughs> yeah, there you go. The whole reason that referees get away with it yes. in the first place is because no one can because f- can. F- Point the gun in the right Fans direction. Fans and opposition clubs and neutrals and uh, uh, massive other social media accounts are just so quick to dive in front of these referees and yeah. protect them from any sort of criticism for uh, for for terrible and awful decisions. They just comp- everyone rushes to the aid, pundits, journalists, uh, other fans of other clubs, and that's that's basically what continues this going on that's why we all as Scottish football fans suffer because everyone just goes ha 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 this only happens to you don't it's happened to us now it was 24 24 hours this week because Rangers the previous day were complaining about a tackle that they believe should have uh, led to a red card on McCausland so uh, uh, 24 hours passes and all of a sudden the referees are fine again because it's happened to Celtic oh it's a conspiracy and all it's it's incredible that how how fast the cycle is of this brain dead you're right 24 hours (laughs) later and all of a sudden the referees are brilliant so (laughs) the Yang penalty um, I thought that was quite soft I thought it could have gone either way but I thought Cochrane was a nuisance yeah. all day um, and I think that on balance of probability I've seen them given and I think it's a fair enough penalty Melly what do you think? Uh, I thought it was soft at the time but I think it's there's been a few ones like that this season not penalties but with Dessers one uh, at Ibrox earlier this mm. season Laga Bielka the way he gets his foot in front and then is taken out kind of the same as that and yeah. if that's the letter of the law now and it's a penalty maybe so but I think it was it was clever if you want to call it from Yang he just gets himself in front of the guy and sort of goes down if it's given against you I think you're furious but if you get it you go ah oh, fair enough maybe it is but I thought it was very very soft but it's a chance for Celtic to take the lead and, lead and I was very disappointed with the penalty. Straight down the hay riddle diddle and it wasn't a good Wow. <laughs> oh, man. All right, mess. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> um, I, I wasn't bothered about the penalty either way. I, I appreciated that. I, I took it. We'll take it. We've yeah. seen them given. But from the ref, for, on the referee's decision, yeah. do you think he got that right or do you think he got fooled by Yang? Do you think it was the wrong decision? I don't, I don't think it was... It's not always necessarily a stonewall penalty or a dive. There's mm. sometimes grey areas in between. So I, I looked at the, the replays. And so the replays show different things depending on the angle. Um, but Well, you see different things. They don't yeah. show different things. You see different things. On one angle, it kind of looks like Cochrane has kicked one of Yang. Accidentally, albeit, but he's kicked one of Yang's feet away from him. And that's, that's what, what I thought the happened. Trip. But then you see it from the, the angle from sort of behind the goal or behind the goal line. And it, Yang has kind of barged into him, not not a, not necessarily a foul, but he's mm. kind of leaned into him, and that's what's kind of initiated the contact. And that's what's probably initiated the lack of balance from Cochrane, and then leads to him kicking his foot out from under him. So I think it probably was a penalty, but I've, it's probably one of the ones you would be arguing against it if it happened the other way around. Yeah. If, if Celtic had conceded it, you'd probably see it from the other. And you can't way. VAR review that, can't you? Know, once the referee's given the penalty and it's not clear and obvious, he can't be called over the monitor and say, do you want another look at this penalty? I don't know how I it works. I can. Re- no. Really, because yeah. I've I've completely lost track of what clear and obvious even means well, anymore. Well, that's what we're going yeah. to come to. Because well, the, the reason I bring that up is because I think it's going to come up when we discuss, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When we discuss some other stuff. And I, 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 Again, it's not a, a brilliant refereeing decision. It could have went either way. I, I took the referees, I took your opinion, Stephen, where I thought... Yang gets himself in front of Cochrane. Cochrane puts a foot out to try and get the ball, but he catches Yang and Yang goes over. I thought that's what happened. And, yeah. and we end up getting the penalty off the back of it. But as Melly so eloquently put it, eh, straight down the hay riddle diddle <laughs> and eh, with no height and it's, it's saved. It was, a, it, was a, it was a poor pen. But are we going to 
Are we going to hammer Edith for this? No, nah. nah, not for me. I, I've seen, I, I get it, it's not necessarily a criticism, but a lot of people are sick of Celtic taking penalties this season. And for good reason, they've missed, what, five out of ten or something mm. outrageous like that. It must be one of the worst records in Europe for any team that's had that number of penalties. I, I've not checked it, but I, I'd be very surprised to learn that any major clubs are missing half of their penalties throughout a a season that I mean, and we've had several takers as well. Mm. How often does that happen across major clubs? But I don't. I'm not going to blame Ida for it for a couple of reasons. One, because it's the the previous record's nothing to do with him. He's just nope. in the door. That's it's like one of those things where you know people throw it at Celtic a lot. Where haven't won a knockout tie in Europe since 2004, right? And that's factually accurate. But pointing at these players, Matt O'Reilly was like, I was, I was three. <laughs> <laughs> Case of break, man. I couldn't do blame anything. Sean Maloney, don't blame <laughs> it on me. <laughs> exactly. So I don't, what I'm getting at is it's unfair to to lump the most recent example of in with the rest. He does just in the door a few weeks and it's the first penalty he's ever missed in his entire career of about 15 or 16 he's taking penalties at international level. I think he scored one against the Netherlands. So he's, by all, on paper, he's a very good penalty taker. He and just I, missed that one. That I don't was think he got good contact on it, as no. you pointed out. The more you watch it, it doesn't look like he hit it sweetly. No, and it, it leads to people, obviously, questioning what happens in training and why are they not practising penalties. No days off, just more penalties. Less days out, more less visiting restaurants and more uh, yeah, taking less penalties. Fun, more yeah. work is <laughs> what it always boils into. Penalties are one of those things though. Yeah, you can practice them all day long and Palma will probably score all of his penalties in training but the problem with a penalty is you have to try and recreate the conditions of taking a penalty and the pressures of taking a penalty and sometimes you can't do that. It's not just a case of re- there's the goal, go up and take it and the keeper is sort of trying and training so I, I think yeah I broadly agree that Celtic should be better at it but I don't think it's because they're not bothered about it and especially when you miss hit it like, I, I, I yeah. don't think it was a strictly a miss hit but he didn't get sweet contact on it it happens yeah, yeah. everybody's missed penalties Dembele, Edward, Henry Larson they've all missed penalties for yeah. us and it, and it happens I'm not going to beat up Adam Mead over it 2024 is here in full swing and that means it's time for New Year's resolution check in with our friends at Manscaped Newsflash, it is never too late to up your grooming game and keep your bush tamed. Manscaped's new lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is every man's cheat code to look good, feel good and turn the page on confidence this year. Whether you're going for a trim or that clean-shaven look, this trimmer has you covered. Trusted by over 10 million men worldwide, it is now your time to get a grip on your grooming with an exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com and use the code TIMS, T-I-M-S, for 20% off and free shipping. The ball is dropped, but don't drop the ball on your balls. Introducing the MVP of 2024, Manscaped's fifth generation lawnmower. It's not just a trimmer, it's your grooming sidekick. It's just a ball sack trimmer to keep your scrotum safely shorn. (laughs) Equipped with two skin safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top and a new foil blade to go smooth, whatever your heart desires. And for my men who want the full grooming experience, look no further than Manscaped's Performance Package 5.0. In this grooming kit, you get the trusted lawnmower, Manscaped's ear and nose hair trimmer, and essential aftercare products with the Crop Soother Ball Aftershave Lotion and Crop Preserver Anti-Chafing Ball Deodorant. Yep, it's deodorant for your balls. Bet you didn't know you needed that. Get 20% off and free shipping when you insert the code TIMS at manscaped.com. Embrace a new you and definitely embrace a new trimmer. Courtesy of Manscaped. The game progresses and then um, John Beaton has an opportunity to interfere in the game. So he's, he's finally he's buzzing about this. Uh, <laughs> previous week's man of the match um, has the ball come towards him. Uh, I think he took it in the chest first, puts his foot out. Alex Cochran anticipating this is what I think happened Alex Cochran anticipating Yang's next move threw himself towards the ball goes down holding his face I've watched the video a dozen times I don't think there was any contact and it's a yellow card now that's the correct decision because it's not reckless it's not brutal there's not excessive force it's a yellow card and it's a yellow card because a couple of weeks ago O does the very same thing I think it was against Livingston I've seen the clip doing the rounds it might have even been last season and he just catches somebody in the face. Oh, actually caught somebody in the face on that occasion. And it's a yellow card. John Beaton is then thinking, right, well, uh, he was man of the match last week. So we really need to get rid of him. If I've got any <laughs> chance of having my coupon up. And, um, and uh, Don Robertson's called over at the monitor. You don't know what he's Who, told. sorry? Ron Robertson, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you don't know what he's told. 
You don't know what the communication is, but more often than not, when they're called over to the monitor, there's an expectation that they need to change their mind. So is the is the VAR call more or less like the gaffer's the gaffer has seen, you know, not those words exactly, but is there an expectation that if you're called over to VAR, it's because the VAR room had a better view of it and it's now, you, you really have to change your mind anyway. He's called over to VAR, he's shown the, as we've discussed before, the completely nonsensical slow motion, Stills. freeze frame, different angle, Neo for the Matrix bullet time camera <laughs> angles, and he, he, he brandishes a, a red card, which for me is never a red card. Stephen uh, Lonnie Shanklin thought it wasn't a red card. Brendan Rogers thought it wasn't a red card. The only guy in the whole of Scotland who thought it was a red card, seemingly, was John Bean. Even Stephen Naismith, he kind of, he was fairly diplomatic about it. Yeah. He said, well, because these other incidents have happened and some of them were red cards, then I suppose it's the right it's the right decision. Mm. But he didn't come out and say, oh, that's a, that's a shocking challenge, absolutely disgraceful, he could have killed him. He didn't say any of that. He just said, ah, well, so, I suppose so, you could probably mm. give a red for that. Even Stephen Naismith was doing that. But I, I get that it looks bad on stills and slow motion replays, as we said. We had the exact same discussion after Dyson Ryder was sent off against Atletico Madrid months ago mm. now. The exact same discussions. So it was refereed in the moment and not deemed a red card. And then, well, here's the here's what I don't understand, right? I understand that if the, the ref was, his attention was diverted somewhere else entirely. So, someone else was having their shirt pulled as they were coming over mm -hmm. to have Yang and he's he's glanced away for a split second, right? And he hasn't seen it. Therefore, VAR gets involved and says, by the way, you better take a look at this incident that happened while you were looking at yes. something else. But if he's looking at this incident and deems it a yellow card, what is the escalation that takes place between then, the thing he's seen, and the red card? What are the degrees of kicking someone in the face? If he thinks he's kicked someone in the face and he gives a yellow mm -hmm. card for it, what has happened to make that incident more serious the second time Correct. around? I don't, I don't understand that That's at all. That's the question, and clear and obvious. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the 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 thing about high boots, right? So th there are so many examples flying all over X where there is great stuff just now. If you, <laughs> really if you look is, at yeah. yeah, there's some great stuff on there. The there are so many examples. The erroneous connection to the Joe Hart one from a, a few weeks ago who what was that again was it St Mirren or yeah, something yeah. yeah somebody came in and studded him in the head the difference there is that he has lunged for the ball yes. and and connected with Joe Hart's head at the time this was Yang just putting his foot above let's say shoulder height mm -hmm. so we're saying there that every elevation of the leg above chest height is therefore inherently dangerous no. play and that's it the VAR is a cheat yeah. Stephen <laughs> right. that is I'm my opinion I'm just trying opinion. to understand yeah. I'm just trying to get yeah. okay right so but what I'm saying is see instead of all these mental gymnastics right yeah. just imagine the guy's a cheat <laughs> yeah. right and then you're like oh suddenly it makes sense like there's a moment of clarity yeah. the guy's the guy cheats I, I had a wee laugh there because I, I was I was a couple of weeks ago John Beaton must have refereed one of our games a couple of weeks ago did he not a home remember. game because I, I was just, I was laughing as you were talking about him. The guy that sits behind me regularly shouted, John Beaton booked something, the guy behind me shouts, put yourself beaten for being a prick. <laughs> <laughs> That's not in the rules. That's not how it works. <laughs> Valchek, prick. <laughs> right. So again, a completely mystifying decision that everyone's yeah. mystified about, including the Hearts players and managers and Celtic. And you can understand why opposition managers and players don't want to come out and say, aye, that's a red card, because it's an incident that could quite literally happened to MD on the pitch. Yeah. The guy has congested the ball. It's gone up a wee bit higher than he thought it would. He's went to get it and another player's come in, stooped his head down and came into him. He's not went into the yeah. player at all. So it's one that MD could get caught out with. And I, I, again, I think with this, it's again, myself and maybe others are just thinking, is this the game we love? Is this what it's becoming? Mm. That everything you do is now open for interpretation, whether that was dangerous or that was reckless. I'm, I'm not wanting to go back to the, the good old days where it was tackles flying in everywhere. But if that's going to be a red card, then we're going to see so many of them and it's going to it's going to take away from the game. It's, it's such a nothing incident that if it just continued the game I don't think we'd be pouring over it on sports scene or people on Twitter would be looking at it I no. just think it was one of these incidents I think being serious for a moment I know I'm sort of being in jest a that wee bit might get sued uh, no, no 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 you just have to prove he wasn't to do that um, uh, being serious 
it, it's you're absolutely right because what Brendan Rodgers said, what we as fans are promised with VAR was it's not going to referee the game. It's no. not going to be refereed at Hamden. It's going to happen in real time. And then if there's anything clear and obvious, but what really is really really curious to me is when you look at the IFAB rules about what constitutes a red card. There's phrases like aggressive, brutal, and yeah. and, and that and it, there's excessive force, excessive stuff force. Like, that, yeah. like you see, there's dig, there's it's actually quite clearly prescribed what is and isn't a red card. So what you're saying is absolutely correct, Stephen. The degrees that from the referee to the VAR, what they how they possibly saw two different things and, and that how that incident escalated from what the referee saw live and in the game to what the VAR saw, it's and another thing that's it's it's massively game changing to send someone off in a in a match. It's massively game changing yeah, yeah, to give yeah. somebody a straight red card. And I think Yang's going to miss three games off the back of it if the appeal doesn't. Aye, if the appeal conduct, aye, if the appeal doesn't work. So you're looking at that instant going. It just doesn't make sense from the perspective of what we were promised with VAR. It doesn't make sense from watching it as a fan in the ninety minutes how the match was refereed. And then when some boffin puts the <laughs> rules up on X, as as you say, Stephen, a lot of great stuff on there. <laughs> when he puts the rules up on X. And you read it, you're like, it doesn't make none of it makes sense. The three stages of the incident don't make sense. The VAR, the, the rules, and now the ban and subsequent missing of games, none of it makes sense to me. No, Melly, you've just you've just said it there. You've just reminded me of something uh, about the incident itself. The player was coming towards Yang. Yeah. You know, I'm not absolving Yang of any blame here because he did put his foot up there in the vicinity of a of a advancing player towards him. So in that way, he has made a mistake. But when you're talking about brutality and excessive mm -hmm. force and aggression and endangering opponents and all that what you've done for that incident is you've removed all of those things and have basically said that if you lift your leg above a certain angle anywhere on the pitch if there's a player in the close vicinity of you it is a straight red card because there is no force mm -hmm. yang is not moving towards the ball he's he is waiting to receive the ball who, that he's chested so we're, that we've completely removed force and all that from from the equation and I've I've been fairly consistent on this, so I'm not accepting any stuff about how are oh, you're just better Tim's or or worse bitter old firm fans who want everything their own yes, way that you that's get from worse. that's yeah, kind of worse, yeah, isn't it? from teams or uh, fans of other clubs and all that you get that quite a lot. But I've been consistent over the years about how I think that accidents and bad tackles and yellow card challenges have to still exist. Mm -hmm. Not everything is a red card. Let's stop trying to make absolutely everything on red card a red card because sometimes stuff happens on the pitch that you. That was just an accident. The guy, Yang was clearly looking at the ball. He shouldn't have lifted his leg up that high in the vicinity of a player. Granted, right? Mm -hmm. But a warning will do for that. Correct. Don't do that again. And and that's fine. We got on with the game. You do not have to issue a straight red card for every single accident that doesn't even lead to injury. See if he'd put his boot straight through the guy's face or, or kicked him straight in the shoulder and he went off balance and landed on his back and it looked terrible. Fine. But at worst... What he did was he brought his foot up and brought it down and it kind of skimmed his shoulder. And he went down holding his face. I don't have a problem with that. That's what players do, yeah. right, in that situation. He made he a meal of it, as Brendan yeah, said. He took advantage of it. I don't care about that, to be honest. I think that refs have to be able to be to see beyond stuff like that because that's very common in football. Players going down holding their face for absolutely no reason. Don't care about that part of it. I just think it's, it's ex excessive in the extreme to issue a straight red card for any old accident that happens in the pitch because you've deemed it that you've put your leg at a certain angle because when you boil down that's exactly what it is you've lifted your leg above a certain angle close to a player you're off the pitch so, so the problem the referees have got is and this will this is sort of more to the point when we're discussing the penalty coming up the problem the referees have got is back in the olden days that Melly was talking about but it was just refereed and a referee got a decision wrong they could quite rightly say, well, from my view or my perspective, or I was unsighted at that instance. So if they don't award something, they could, they could claim to be unsighted. Or if they did award something, they could claim it happened in a split second and I don't have the benefits of a replay. And that's my view of it. However, they do now. And the VAR is there. And the VAR, presumably, because they're working at a desk with computers, has, and the fact that they're qualified referees, they have access to the rule book. So they know exactly what is and what isn't a rule. And with the... If I was being even 1% fair, I could say that the on-pitch ref was influenced by the the replays and the stills to make that look like a lot worse than it was. And when you watch the replay, he is maybe 12, 15 yards from the incident and he's got players in front of him. So the VAR could have feasibly said, did you get a good view of that? Because I think you might want to take another look at it. And he might go, actually, no. Number 15 was kind of standing in my way when most of it happened. So let me go have a look. He sees the replays, he sees the freeze frames, which make it look 10 times worse, and he goes, right, do you know what? That does now 
look yeah. like it constitutes a red. So if I was being ten percent fair to to Ron, I would say right, okay, <laughs> I can understand maybe on that path of events why you came to that conclusion, right? But what next happens is the Awata incident, where the handball rule in Scotland has been scrutinised to the nth degree, to the point where the SFA had a meeting during the international break last year. Was it last year's international break or this year's international break in November the time? Last year, because they brought it in before the World Cup, didn't they? Yeah, yeah that's so right. Genius so, idea. Yeah, so they had a, during the international break, they had a confab about... Yeah, we know this handball rule is out of control and we're going to change it because we were seeing things like the Matt O'Reilly handball, the Burnaby handball. like The me- Smith one at Tynecastle for the, in the very first game, yeah. we just leaned down and handballed it. Me- mental decisions being awarded and that, that just didn't make sense to fans or anyone. So then IFAB kind of changed the rules ever so slightly and here we are today, right? That handball decision, there's only one man, I think, in the whole world maybe the universe, right? <laughs> that thought that that was a penalty and a handball, and it was John Bean. And yeah. when you when you look at the high fab rule, so the ball's up in the air. AJ, Tomo, and a Hearts player, I'm not sure who it was, all go to win the header. It either comes off AJ, I think it comes off AJ, who then, in the process of trying to win the ball, nudges Tomo, who falls forward, meaning his hands go backwards, that's physics, and the ball bounces off his elbow. And the referee or the VAR spots that and decides it's a, a penalty. Now, one, we've already had the discussion about handball rules in Scotland. We've already had that discussion and it was all cleared up. That's worse than the Burnaby. That's in the same league as the Burnaby one, if yeah, you're being honestly similar, fair. Yeah. Number two, that's not even within the rules because it shouldn't be a penalty award if the player in the same team heads it on to somebody. Number three in the rule is if your body is in a position natural to the movement that you're making, which he is, it shouldn't be a penalty. And number three, how on earth can you possibly watch that decision and go, the correct course of action here is an <laughs> is a direct shot from 12 yards for goal. <laughs> That's the punishment for that. It, none of it makes sense, but crucially, it doesn't make sense based on the conversations the SFA have had about the handball rule. It doesn't make sense when you read the rules. It doesn't make sense when you watch it. But the problem I think Ron had is as soon as he's presented with the video of it hitting Awata's arm, as soon as he's shown that video, he now has to come up with a very, very, very good reason not to award it. Yeah. Because come Monday morning when they all have the meeting back back at work and they presumably go over the decisions, I showed him a video of a handball and he decided not to award the penalty. Why not? You can't, you can't really get out of it. There's no way out of it for the on-field ref. If that video is presented to him, the mm-hmm. on-field ref needs to have I'm glad you said Balls that because people will be complaining and saying, look, he's got the final say. It doesn't matter what Beaton says because he's got the final decision. But you, as you rightly put it, he then has to explain. He's got, got to go back and say why he didn't give that yeah. note despite the advice against And he's it. on the side of the pitch. And it's, I don't think for one minute the discussion is going, well, actually, um, Mr. Beaton, if you look at rule 2.1, the appendix says that when the body moves, no, no, he's just told handball, come have a look at this. Sees a video, boink, okay, penalty. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, and again, the referee watches a video of himself watching the incident, yeah. <laughs> doesn't he? So I, I, I think it was a scandalous decision, to be honest. I think. Do you think? Do you think John Beaton cheated? I don't know, but I, don't, I just don't see how he can sit there and say, "No, that's a penalty." I, I can't. I can't sit here and call my cheat. I can't sit here and get into his head and think, right? Maybe he's seen this, or maybe he's seen that. The guy is up for a header, doesn't win the header, is looking the other way, is pushed. He's coming down, his body moves and a ball hits him. And I d- even when you, you watched it in real time, it said, oh, VAR checking something. Like, what are they checking? I, I can't understand. Yeah, not one appeal from anybody about I can't it. understand what they're checking. And again, if I take it back and away from Celtic, I'm looking at it again and saying, what are players meant to do? So again, go back to the Yang one. If a guy's coming towards you, you cannot put your foot up in there because he might run into you and then you get a red card. Now, should you not jump for a header now? Is it more beneficial for you? You see players running out with their arms behind their back. This is starting to have a massive effect again on the did game you, we love. Did you see that injury that guy got because he was running out towards the ball with his hands behind his back? No. <laughs> It was doing the rounds on X. It's uh, it's hor- he's running with a ball, but he's got his hands behind his back, presumably to stop any sort of handball. Right? Someone slide tackles him. He falls completely forwards, and he folds like one of those old phones. 
Oh, it really? abs- it's absolutely brutal and it happens because he can't get his hands out in front of himself. Ralston did it for Celtic a couple of weeks ago. He ran out to meet a cross and instead of falling out to get the cross, he decided, if I get any closer to this, I'm going to concede a penalty. So he stuck his hands behind his back and the cross came in that led to a goal it's against Celtic. It's it's not how the game works. It, no. it, but I don't see... I know, the ha- I know, right, even in this world, Stephen, of where the handball rule is pretty mental just now, and it kind of doesn't make sense, and we're kind of confused about VAR, even in, even within the scope of, of how the handball rule exists, that's out with it. Yeah. And and I know we could say, ah, but the handball rule's a bit sketchy. Well, yes. If that's a penalty, then every time it has a hand, it's got to be a penalty, every and single time. And it's not, because even last week at Motherwell, we saw it wasn't, and this is why it's so cut and dried for me, that y- you have to really go far to convince me that these refs are just completely useless. <laughs> Yeah. Because I just don't believe they would still be employed at this point. Like the, the, it's high paying job. It is a very, very by uh, by all accounts, it's a very difficult to become a grade one referee. It's a high paying job, as a, as I've said, as I repeat myself, looking for other things to list. <laughs> but the, the fact of the matter is, the, the the only defense available. I know I'm sort of jokingly saying uh, John Beaton's a cheat, but the only defense available is we're not cheats. We are just so useless to the point where we can't be relied upon as a collective. But to me, it's it's as blatant as I'm sitting here. John Beaton sitting across from me. There's a biscuit on the table. I turn my back. The biscuit's gone. He's gone. It wasn't me. That <laughs> well, is that blatant. Yeah. Uh, what is it? If you if you hear you hear hoofs outside, it might be a zebra, but it's probably a horse. Aye. <laughs> Aye. So this decision, right? I, again, I've, I've tried to be fairly balanced about this. These these previous decisions, and we are we are escalating now. We're getting we're getting more egregious as as we go on. The penalty I could have seen either way with Yang. The red card, I understood why it was given. I completely disagreed with it, but I, I thought, right, if he's going to stick his foot up there, he's given the referee a decision to make all those tired old cliches, right? But this one, th- this handball was a disgraceful decision. Absolutely outrageous, to mm. be honest. And Brendan Rogers said something after the game. Melly, you've just said, said something very similar there. He said that if that's a penalty, then you're going to have a penalty in every single game. Please I'd, don't give Celtic more penalties. Yeah, no, but. I'm sure we don't need more penalties. But I actually disagree with that. I actually disagree with that that assertion that we're going to see penalties in every game. That's the opposite of the problem. The problem is they're not awarded for the yeah, exact same on. things all the time. So these these handballs happen all the time. And I, I, I hate to sort of drag us into the... Con, it's, not, it's not about a conspiracy. It's one guy, right? Conspiracy suggests that there's collusion between more, more than one party. It was John Beaton. But on this there's occasion... There's no conspiracy. We are watching things every week. We're watching the same incident happen. Yeah. And then the very next week, the same incident happen and get refereed in a different way. And the problem you've got, as soon as you flag it up, everyone goes conspiracy. Yeah. C- no, I'm not going to be... It's not conspiracy. I watched, Abel- I watched the Motherwell game last week. I watched the same incident get refereed in one way. And it's the referee. There's no excuse. The referee can't say he's unsighted. Blah 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 blah. Because there's a VAR there with the rules in front yeah. of him, and then the VAR in the next game with the rules in front of him decides something different. It would actually be a lot simpler if it was the case. If it were the case that right, all of these now are penalties. No arguments. Yes. They're all penalties because everyone would gradually used to that. It would be absurd to yeah. start with, mm-hmm. but everybody would get used to it, and that would then act as a deterrent. Everyone would start playing the game differently and would stop handballing it eventually, and then there would be very few handballs in the box. But that you know penalties against that kind of thing would act as a deterrent and cut down. But that's that's not what's happening. The fact is, some are being awarded and some aren't. We've said it so many times, and everyone, you know, everyone spots it. Conor Goldson accidentally handballs it in almost every single game, yep. and it's never awarded against him. Never ever, regardless of how it happens. There was one against Motherwell, and Brendan Rodgers referenced it. I think it was Casey. I think yeah, it was, was yeah. the guy who handballed it. Again, it's accidental. It happened but in our Motherwell yeah, game as well, didn't it? It's accidental, but. Yeah. He is actually moving towards the ball. His his entire intention is to block the ball. He's just accidentally done it with his hand. So he has he's done his job there. He's blocked a shot with his hand accidentally. Tomoki Iwata has blocked nothing with the back of his arm as he's moving away from the ball, and the, the ball just sort of bobbled away and would have been cleared anyway. It, it was it led to nothing. It didn't directly affect anything, but they've given a penalty there's, for it. I think too, it's outrageous. There's too much ambiguity. This yeah. this rule as it stands just now, even though that I don't even think that a handball award was within the rule. It, it, it is just a license to award penalties whenever you want them. It's, it gives a referee too much influence in the game. And I simply don't understand why a VAR with a monitor, it, as you said, Stephen, it's not about the penalties every game. It's the, the, the masses of them that are missed. Yeah. There is, there's, lit, there's literally no explanation no. for why you, with the benefit of cameras, monitors, slow motion and the rule book in front of you, would ever, ever, ever miss this. 
And that's why, to me, as you say, it's just so obvious. Like, if you hear drums out your front window, it might be a Pink Floyd concert. <laughs> it might be It might be something else. It might be... I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Do you think Brendan was right to dig up uh, John Beaton? Oh, he, he named he, him twice. Na- name-checked him twice. And I can understand why, because, look, it was a missed... I can't say it's a missed opportunity for Celtic because they went there with the intention to win the game and then end up with 10 men and a penalty given against them. And look, Hearts are a decent team at this level, so it's going to be very difficult. And I think Brendan Rodgers is rightly seeing. I can point to faults in Brendan Rodgers. I can point to faults in the players for most of the, for pretty much all the time Celtic have dropped points this season. But for this one, I can't. Celtic came into it on a high. They'd been playing well. They had a chance to go top because their rivals had dropped points and it felt like it was sort of snatched away from them. And I I understand these frustrations there completely because we've been here before getting explanations from referees. Remember in his first stint, that game at Ibrox we were at and the ball went out for a shy and all of a sudden they're giving Rangers the shy and Emilio Azaghini's <laughs> like, what, what, I don't understand what's going on here. And we know Celtic asked for exp- explanations on this, but there has to, Rangers rightly so said, release the audio. Well, let's hear the audio from this. Let's, yes. let's hear how this conclusion came because something's went wrong and if if that's a penalty, Lord help us, man, because the game we, we love so much is... It's going away from what, what we're meant to be here. I just think it we're in very, very dangerous territory. You know, again, joking about John Beaton being a cheat aside, it's that happens so frequently in matches, right? The the melee in the box and the ball bouncing and I mean coming off the back of a player's hand as he's been pushed and fallen back down to the ground after trying to win a header when he's not looking at the ball and has no idea and it trundles off the back of it. Like a a, a VAR could just quite simply go, penalty. Yeah. Penalty, penalty, every second. Do whatever you want, or, or as we've seen in the games, not. There's, it's a complete mess. It's an absolute scandal that the penalty was awarded, and the referee has the referee in that game, or the VAR rather, just had far too much influence on the outcome of the match. Far, far too much. And I think the problem we've got is, I, I just I'm interested to see the fallout from this because Brendan Rodgers called it out, and he called out the incompetence, and y- you have to. You have to defend yourself against that. You have to defend yourself against the incompetence. So they need to give Celtic and Brendan Rodgers some sort of explanation, as Melly said, about how these decisions were reached. Yeah, yeah. There is no two ways about it. And hell, mind you, if you come out and say no, sorry, it was a mistake. That shouldn't have happened. Now they're not going to admit to that because the no. SFA regularly crow about how many of these decisions they get right. I think I had a look back at the statement they put out recently. Ninety-seven point six percent of decisions were correct. That's high. I, that is really yeah, high. high. I, I think you'll find Jamie that the head of refereeing will probably go on a radio show this week, like he always does at these big oh, decisions yeah. over the years. He's always out and about. He's been heard of twice. Yes, once was to criticise Kyogo for diving, and the second was to compliment the Rangers manager on on <laughs> what a great job he's done since he arrived. Um, but I, I, I think I'm interested to see the fallout because you're not allowed to criticise referees' competence. You're not allowed to just come out and call them incompetent, which again, to me, is astounding. Like yeah. the, the fact that's written into the rules that you're not allowed to do that. Brendan Rodgers could end up with a ban here, but I hope Celtic don't back down from it because they're, they're, I'm not saying there's any massive conspiracy. I'm not saying that you know, I'm not saying for talking sake that John Beaton's like a known Rangers fan and the the very weekend that Rangers dropped points with only nine games left, he's the VAR in the room <laughs> for Celtic v Hearts for talk's sake and he, he sends off a player who was man of the match the week before and then follows that up with a pen. I'm not saying You haven't he, said any of I'm that. not no, saying you haven't said uh, any you know, of that. That's that sort of fantasy that you would <laughs> never sort of come up with. Um, so I'm not saying he did all that deliberately but what I'm saying is there needs to be explanations given to the Celtic manager and now Celtic that they've written to the SFA because it can't just be blown under the carpet aye. or swept under the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> blown under the carpet. Now, aye, I know. And the, the, this handball rule has got to go. It's It's got to go. No, it's, got to, <laughs> it's got to be fixed because there's so, as you said, there's so much ambiguity about it. I would even understand if, but you see if what had happened there was Tomoki Iwata completely inadvertently, unknowingly, handballed it with the back of his mm-hmm. with his tricep and it falls to Kyogo and he smashes it into the top corner at that point I would understand right well 
can you really give that goal? Because the only reason it fell to Kyogo was because it accidentally hit somebody's hand rate. So I, I would understand that. And even with that very controversial one where Alistair Johnson handballed it out of the pitch mm. with the SEMA thing, remember remember yeah. that whole thing about how it, it was offside anyway, um, as we know. <laughs> and then it, it, didn't, it wouldn't have counted anyway, but people were demanding to know why it wasn't given as a penalty. Even at that, I said... I get why that is a penalty because the only reason the ball went out of play was because Alistair Johnson mm. handballed it. See if your team gains a, an unfair advantage from someone accidentally handballing it. I get why there's a discussion to be had there, but not when it just glances somebody's bicep or whatever in the, in a box and it leads to absolutely nothing. It's, a it's ridiculous. It, yeah. it, it was a def- and like you say, if there's a number of scenarios that you're like, if Iwata jumps up to head it himself, puts his arm out, misses the header and it bounces off his arm and goes away. Yeah. You could maybe say, right, well, he's in influ- But it, it's just the nature of it is just completely nonsense going. I'm so I'm so glad Brendan Rodgers called it out because p- part of me is willing to accept that that is, if Celtic were 15 points clear, I don't know if Brendan Rodgers would be calling that out. He's obviously seething after the game because yeah, the yeah. game means a lot. But he's absolutely bang on to call it out and I think he was right to defend the players. I think, you know... The- <sighs> I don't. I can't fault the players' effort. I just can't. Having watched the game, I can't fault the effort. There was some performances that weren't great. I don't think Greg Taylor's was great. I don't no, think no. Liam Scales was great. I'm not going to battle the players for that. You know, that's a skill issue on a lot of it. It wasn't so much an effort issue. Maeda skill issue. Yeah. No real an issue of effort for me. Um, I thought Adamida played well. Kyogo. I'm not going to just run through the players. I just broadly, I just think that the, the squad played okay. They did the best they could under the circumstances in a very very difficult venue and I think Brendan Rodgers he went for it he, yeah, he yeah. went for it I think in terms of performance and talking points I think what's more interesting to me is Brendan Rodgers not bringing home Kuhn or Palma off the bench those three guys yeah. sitting on the bench is quite telling for yes. me yeah and I think from what we've seen well from what I've seen of Kuhn and Palma I feel like I haven't seen much of uh, home but he has been substituted in a lot of games where you just think you forget he's on the pitch and with Palma and more so Kuhn it's the work rate that's been lacking hasn't it mm. so to go down to 10 men and the way Celtic played as well the 4-3-2 you can't really fit any of these guys in can you unless you go four to two wide players and one up front but I don't know if that would have suited it, the game either I think Celtic did what they had to do, went 4-3-2 when they got to half time and brought on Kyogo, I thought he'd come on for Maeda and we'd just stick with that but Bernardo's performance was so poor I thought he had right. to be hooked as well and Celtic He's turning a bit of a nothing player Bernardo isn't he? Had yeah, a back good, into a nothing player uh, He yeah. had a good wee spell and we thought, you know what the way he's looked, if he continues this he's only 5 million, you might as well sign him but now you're looking at it going I mean, we'll talk three about, games in it really. Uh, awesome. right. We'll talk a, about the recruitment. He had a bit of a hot streak, and uh, you get carried away because you're a fan, and like he scored against Rangers, that's mm. fine. But he's not managed to get a place back, and even at that, the only thing I could maybe say well, we were maybe bringing on Danny Kelly at half time and go sticking with four three two. But by that time, you're a goal down to a nonsense decision, and Celtic have to go and try and win the game, don't they? And I think with the the players, I can't really fault them, like you say, for effort. There was some poor performances. Again, Liam Scales can do better at the goal, I think. The second goal, I think. Uh, right, I just, want, just to jump in there, because I want to be absolutely fair to the players, I agree Liam Scales could have done better at the goals, and there was a few moments, but he also had a few really good interceptions in the match. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that's what he does, isn't it? He's good at that last ditching, but at Celtic, that's not exactly what you're need, mm. what there for as a defender. So I think there was performances that could have been better, but it's difficult out there in a venue like that when you are down to 10 men, you don't have that extra player to hit. And Celtic just had to sort of adapt their game and try and play, but also go a bit direct and up against Hearts, back three that drops into a back five. It was going to be difficult. And I think once you're chasing the game, then you're always you're chasing players and all that. It's the decisions that were wrong and I felt Kyogo made some wrong decisions sometimes and other players where he'd, he'd take on a shot instead of maybe if Celtic weren't as tired or weren't trying to force things he'd maybe slid somebody in for a pass so it just wasn't a, a game for Celtic but I, I can't come away from it going oh you should have won that game it, it doesn't get much the, more the, difficult The sort that. of criticism really for the game Stephen goes to the usual culprits there's been 
you know, Greg Taylor, I don't think, had a good game. Some of the no, passing was terrible, He man. was good recently because he, he set up several goals recently. Mm. He set up a couple against Indy. He scored one against um, We should Dundee. be on talking about that. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know. I know. Cruelly taken away from us. He, he set up one for Ida in the previous game. So He's, he's been good lately. He's been good, but he was disastrous against Hearts, right. to be honest. He was absolutely terrible. And not many people were. The, the Coon and Palmer I, thing... I've got a theory about Greg Taylor, though. Right, I, 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 I like Greg Taylor. Yeah. Right, and I think he's... I don't think he's the best player at Celtic, right? Which is absolutely fine because you can only have maybe three or four of those. And if we sign a new left back, I dare say Greg Taylor may lose his place to him. Although that being said, we've tried. And still <laughs> well, work. we'll see. Do you know what I mean? We'll see, right? But so I do like Greg Taylor. And I found it odd that his contract runs out next year because we've been handing out contracts willy nilly lately. And it seems like the Greg Taylor contract's probably a, a, an oversight, or maybe people at the club are just happy to let him go. Whatever the case may be. I don't think going forward in the future he's going to be Celtic's answer and Brendan Rodgers' answer at a left back. I think that much is obvious. But he's performed quite well. He's under Ange. He's performed quite well in the last couple of games for Celtic. And that was a poor one. But I thought to myself, is Greg Taylor a player who only plays well and the rest of the team are playing well? Yeah, he, that's it, harsh. Do you think that's harsh? Or do you think... Has he ever changed the game for us? Yeah, I think last season under Ange, there was... Uh, Stephen, you said it. He was at the heart of a lot of good Celtic yeah. do. And I think uh, the big change recently over the past couple of games is the fullbacks have been getting purposeful balls into the box and it's led mm. to Celtic scoring so I think that maybe is slightly harsh on Greg Taylor he is the guy that sort of you look at the team and go we need to improve there but even even if you don't improve on Greg Taylor you need to have an able understudy that can come on Celtic were down to 10 men and didn't use their full selection yeah, of subs, two subs yesterday it was two subs. so why would you not do that why would you not look to freshen it up because the options aren't there and if we in an ideal world you'd have a right and a left back on your bench that you can call upon Celtic need to have these players to rotate out Greg Taylor's coming back from injury I'll put it down to a bad game but Awata I think has been really good recently and I thought he had a poor game as well so yep. I think it's just one of those games that it was difficult for players and made a bit more difficult by some poor performances but no lack of effort get away with one where Awata when that goal was marginally yeah. very yeah. marginally offside for, for that was Shanklin's one we yeah, got away terrible. with one where Awata but Carter Vickers was brilliant that Aye, was yeah. very purposeful making sure Definitely. that was offside you see when you watch that back it gets even worse because the pass is on for ages yeah. and ages yeah. and Awata, it's something we, we've thrown around so many criticisms of that this season holding on to the ball for too long and it tends to be the centre halves that do that and sometimes the full backs I know we criticise the referees for what you're thinking but you, that's you're, you're in the same ballpark when you're watching Awata yeah yeah. High pressure game, right like, before half time. Right before you're half down. time, you're a goal down, and he's just dillying on the ball. You're like, what? What are you thinking, man? Yeah, I, I don't think he had a good game at all, and it's shot it's for just, thirty it's, yards. Was yeah, uh, yeah, infuriating. Just one of those guys who can't really see me get going. Whenever he looks good, he has a little bit of a setback, and I think that's he's only made something like thirty-one appearances for Celtic the entire time he's been here. Some injuries in there as well, but he's never really grabbed a place, and he's not, it's very difficult with Callum McGregor there, but. Brendan Rodgers has been trying to get him into the team more regularly and move, move Callum McGregor around to accommodate mm. that. But that was a shocker, to be honest, at, at Tain Castle. So it's, it's a bad game. I don't think he's had many of those, no. if any, really. So I think we can we can kind of chalk that afternoon up to a, a bad day at the office for a lot of people, including the just the team in general. I don't think the I don't think the entire blame lies with them, but what happens is that even with all these circumstances, and I'm not going to blame the manager or the players for that because I think it, they were up against it. What's let us down is once again squad depth because Kuhn and Palmer, as we've already mentioned, sat there the entire time. And again, like, we, you might not be able to find a coherent system that, that works with those guys in it. But see, when you're, see when there's like six minutes to go and you're 2-0 down at Tynecastle, is there not even space for a Hail Mary? Just stick to these. Especially though, in the Discord and on social media, um, I noticed not one person was like, we need to get Palmer on to no, change the no, game. We I need to get Kuhn on them. to... Uh, Kunon to change the game that's my whole point Aye. that's my whole point they didn't even become a consideration and these two guys are the biggest attacking signings we've made for quite a mm. while I mean they're not not major outlays they're not I mean we need to get away from the idea that 2.8 million or whatever is a massive amount for a attacking player at Celtic it's, it's nothing these days but the fact that Celtic have brought them both in in recent years and they've not really what are them not, going into play now ah, yeah, Yang no, suspended and they've not been fancied to get chucked onto a, a must win well, not so much must, must win but we're chasing a yeah. couple of goals here and on that it's like it's damning yeah it's it, damning it, for them. it definitely is and that's now again this game's a bit of an anomaly but 
the reason we're in this position, the reason we've failed to capitalise on that and go back top of the league is because we've dropped too many points elsewhere. Yeah. That's the second time we've lost to Hearts this mm. season. And again, it's totally different circumstances to the other one. But that's over 200 minutes since we've even scored against Hearts when you take into account that. I think Iwata was about 10 minutes to go at Tynecastle. The last time we've gone two games since without mm. scoring against them, including injury time and all that. Drop too many points to the likes of Kilmarnock and all that. So it's, it's not great. And see, overall... I'm starting to kind of get the feeling about this Celtic team that well, that was a very difficult game to to navigate because of everything we've spoken about. Not a team that scores an awful lot of goals these days. Uh, now no. I'm conscious of the fact that they put seven past seven past Indeed just this week, but they, they they do have these wee busts. So there was seven goals against Indeed, most of them in one half. Then they scored four goals against Aberdeen at home in injury time to make it six 0 But I think as it stands, we get six to eight league goals this mm. season with nine games to go. Last season was 114, so we'd need to score about 50 goals just to just to sort of. I, I remember keep that. the hell, Steve. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the thing is, it's when you're looking at with the majority of those goals, Kyogo was absolutely on fire. Yeah. Jota, Abada, Atati, oh, Atati. Yeah. I mean, those four names we mentioned are probably pushing 60 odd league goals, and and, and, I get, and again, no played. It, this is this is self inflicted here because we need to stop talking about Jota because he's been gone for ages, but it's still a problem as we see because we're not scoring enough goals. But several wingers have been brought to the club since and we're still well, scrabbling around. I did notice for... with interest that the same week that the head of recruitment and the head scout resigned. There was that. There was that. I noticed with interest in the same week Brendan Rogers said, eh, I am um, either. His agent knew I was a fan. So when the opportunity came up, you know, he's a player that I identified as agent phoned me and I took him on. Sort of saying, the best signing that we've made all, all year really is absolutely nothing to do with the guy yeah. who's just walked yeah. out the door. And I think... Look, you can, as we've said repeatedly on the podcast with respect to Mark Lowell, it, it makes no difference what to me what his surname was. The last two guys in similar roles lasted two windows or so and were bombed out for, yeah. for failing to provide the manager with usable players. And that is exactly what's happened here. Now, there might be internal politics at play. There might be, you know, I think Brendan Rogers was talking about the head scout. It provided a lot of players for Ange did a good job providing players for Ange in the style of play that Ange wanted. There's obviously been some sort of disconnect between what Brendan wants to see in terms of players coming in and what has come in. And I don't really care about what the guy's surname was. It just it just wasn't working. We as the fans, right? Forget even Brendan Rodgers for a minute. We the fans were woefully let down in terms of product on the park, seeing big name players go and replacements not come in, see key positions identified and players not come in, see mistakes made in the summer and not rectified in the January window, all these things, it's 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 just no right, it's not the way the football club should go, so it's it's right that he's gone, it's right that the, the, the scout's gone, and there's now a, a, an opportunity there to actually build the club that I think we need to see it and we need yeah. we, we need to see quality players and we need to see players in the in the mould that Brendan Rodgers wants all this talk about pace and power the only player that represents that is Adam Eder yeah For certainly me. the only one that's come in the only in one that's recent come in windows. Like the, the thing about Adam Eder being brought to the club via Brendan Rodgers and a, an agent it kind of confirms what we feared all along about how Celtic do business it's all yeah. just agents it's all just mm -hmm. agents picking up the phone saying do you want this guy aye sounds good aye yeah. work like how old is he? What kind of salary does, does he want? Has he played a wee bit? Has he got a wee bit under 21 international? Bring him home. It's, it's all just agents picking up the phone because I noted that Brendan Rodgers said he was responsible for that signing, but it was the other way around. It was the agent that picked up the phone to Brendan Rodgers and mm. said, by the way, we've got this guy. Do you want him? Aye, crack on. And I think so that's... What, what I think is that... actually, sorry, to, just to, to finish that off, it's... So what is it that's actually happening behind the scenes in terms of recruitment? We we all picture it as if we've got this vast network of scouts across the globe and they're all picking up the phone and they're watching these these young kids playing in, in far-flung, well, undiscovered I think that, countries. I, I, I mean, I don't, obviously, we don't know, right? We just, yeah. we are not in with Celtic. We don't hear really anything. We're just bloody world-class podcasters. <laughs> and, but to me, Stephen, what you're saying, I imagine is not a million miles off the conversations Brendan Rodgers has. So when he sits down at the beginning of the season and he's told, right, we've got, this is how the scouting setups, and we've got Mark Law and he's got contacts here and there and we've got good contacts in Korea and Sweden and Norway. Brendan Rodgers is like, oh, brilliant, right? Bro, so you need, you can get me all these players, fantastic. And then he comes in, it doesn't he come to fruition and Brendan Rodgers like, so what is it that's actually happening up, up in that other office? Because yeah. it's taken me to get in contact with somebody I know 
to get me a player in that's, that's any good and Adam Eda's done really well since he came in meanwhile the guys that everyone else seems to have recruited over the last couple of months are not even they're not even not only are they not getting games no one's crying out for them to get games no, no. no one's screaming for Palmer or Kuhn to get a, a game for Celtic here we're, I defy getting... anyone to even remember that Kuhn was there when we were chasing a goal in a crucial game away to Ten, away at Tencastle when we were desperate when we were down to 10 men but everybody was like oh you need to get Kuhn on he's this big proven quality signing <laughs> was oh, madness up. home to go home yeah. I mean all these guys you can rhyme them off and they've made no impact at all so Melly I think it's just I think it's right that the, the, the recruitment gets a shake up in the summer yeah it definitely needs it it's been terrible for a while now and like we, we've said before we all hope that Celtic were getting their ducks in order. We thought, right, we're making early signings and all that. But it turns out it was just Ange. It was Ange that was doing it all. Mm. And as soon as he's gone, it's all gone with him. And again, we just need to come into this century, Celtic, and do things properly. Mm. You are a football club. Your job is to win football games. And like Stephen says, find the best players for each position. But when you look at Celtic squad, it is littered with positions that need upgraded before we've even lost MD again and we're going to lose players in the summer so a shake-up is needed is Mark Lowell going the shake-up we need no, no chance. it's not no. it's just got to be the start of something but it won't be it'll probably be oh look he's away we'll bring somebody else in but it has to be root and branch we have to get to the the bottom of this figure out what's going wrong and sort it now because if we do manage to win this league this season, great. But we will lose one soon because we're not doing the things off the pitch correctly. I think um, I think what's important to remember though is <laughs> <laughs> keep the hell. Yeah, uh, that's right. We might have we might be sitting here week in week out. It seems like moaning about Celtic and how bad Celtic have been and all that. And yeah, we missed an opportunity to go top of the league this season but the job remains the same yeah yeah. nothing changes and to be honest with you that, that Celtic team that lost 2-0 at Hearts there to me looked a lot different for the Celtic team that lost 2-0 at home at Hearts and there's been season in the past not so long ago where we've kind of hit our straps just, just at the right time and it's important I think that the manager just keeps everyone's head above water here he's got he's got a job in his hands oh, he, yeah. he's right. honestly got a job in his hands because you you think you're gaining somewhere with the Motherwell result and then that happens and you just need to keep everything going and I think ironically I think for Celtic had they won that game the next having a week or so off league duty would probably benefit them I think ironically having the game pan out the way it has the best thing would have just have another game on Wednesday yeah, just get right I, back yeah. on those but we don't have that we've got cup duty against Livingston and then we're, we're back at league stuff hopefully that'll give us an opportunity to get some players back um, but it's not over no, it's, no, it's still no. not over not by a long shot and I'm sure Brendan is <laughs> I mean he was he was stressed after yeah. that game you can tell like, it's starting to get to him a wee bit but we won't let it get to us listen thank you so much for joining us for this week's 20 Minute Tims we'll be back next week if you want to support us on Patreon you can do that or if you want ad free videos you can do that right from YouTube patreon.com slash 20 Minute Tims thank you for watching and listening <laughs> <laughs>